Um, welcome to the NUS Stanford Public Forum on Seeding Asia's High-Tech Future and Accelerating Social Impact. I am Missy Devlin. I'm the Deputy Director of Corporate Communications here at NUS Business School, and I will be the MC today. So this forum is made possible through the close collaboration of four organizations, NUS Business School, Stanford Graduate School of Business, NUS Enterprise, and the Stanford Alumni Association. In particular, we want to extend a special thank you to Professor Wang Po Kam from NUS Enterprise, who brought these four organizations together for today's event. <laughs> the NUS Business Portal, Knowledge Portal, Think Business, is also live webcasting this event. The recorded session will be available for viewing next week, as well as some associated interviews at thinkbusiness.nus.edu. I encourage you to subscribe to the portal and take a look as the content is both relevant and engaging. We invite those watching via the webcast to send any questions for the Q&A session to hashtag NUS Stanford, one word. And um, for those in the audience, when you use the microphone to ask your question, please identify yourself with your name and your affiliation to NUS or Stanford, um, especially for those watching on the webcast. And now I'd like to highlight a few of our esteemed guests today in the audience from Stanford Graduate School of Business. They've come a long way, so it's worth letting us all know where they are and where they're seated. I'm going to ask them to um, raise their hand when I call their name. And then afterwards, during the um, coffee break, if you could please welcome them warmly, as I know we all will from NUS and, and Singapore. So welcome to Assistant Dean Glenn Carroll. Professor Yossi Feinberg, <laughs> and Professor Ilya Strebulev. <laughs> Your presence here today makes the forum all the more dynamic and it's much appreciated. Thank you for coming to Singapore. And finally, welcome to alumni visitors from both Stanford Alumni Association and the NUS alumni. We're thrilled to have you here. And so now let's get on with things. I only met today's moderator yesterday, but I already feel like I've found an old friend. And I know many of you will feel the same when you get the same opportunity. Engaging, friendly, smart, those are just all descriptors that come to mind. Not surprising when you read her professional biography outlining her business experience at companies like Hewlett Packard and Agilent as head of a worldwide $1.2 billion supply chain management business. But in my mind, more important than the business accolades, of which there are many, today's moderator, a decision sciences professor here at NUS Business School, is the recipient of the NUS Departmental Teaching Excellence Award. This is an appropriate recognition of how she has successfully linked academia to industry, taking what she learned in her business career to help inspire future business leaders. She walks the talk in that she is also a board of governor for the Singapore American School, Again, that connection as my daughter attended SAS. It's a terrific international school successfully shaping young minds. No small surprise our moderator is actively involved. This experience also explains why our moderator is such an engaging judge on the popular entrepreneurship television show, Angel's Gate. Please join me in welcoming today's moderator, Sheila Wang. I'm, I'm humbled, Missy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, and a very welcome to all of you for joining us in our panel discussion on seeding Asia's high-tech future and accelerating social impact, the role of startup incubators in Asia. And to those of our audience joining us from abroad outside of Singapore via, via webcast, we also extend a very warm welcome. Asia, as you know, has been the most dynamic growth regions in the world for the past two decades. And in helping to propel the growth of Asia, startup entrepreneurs have been a major driving force in bringing innovative technologies to market. What can be done to, what can, <laughs> that can be done, okay. Okay, what, what, what can be done to incubate, to help incubate more Asia startups. And also at the same time, is it possible or what is needed to help 
to increase more inclusive growth for the lower and bottom of the socioeconomic pyramid. So that's what we are here to talk about this afternoon. And it is um, with great honor and pleasure that we have assembled a panel of distinguished thinkers, academic scholars, leading practitioners, and pioneers in this area in accelerating high-tech and also social ventures through innovative incubation models. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our panelists. To my right, we have the high-tech panel, and to my left, the social impact panel. We're going to engage and uh, <laughs> collaborate and, yeah. I'm very low tech. <laughs> I'm going to start with you then. Okay, so to my right, let me uh, introduce to you Dean Bernard Yun, Dean of NUS Business School and also the Stephen Riotti Distinguished Professor. Dean Yun serves on the board of Intellectual Property Office of Singapore, the Graduate Management Admissions Council, and, on the, on, and also on the Monetary Authority of Singapore's Financial Research Council and the Management Advisory Committee of the Standards, Productivity, and Innovation Board, Spring Singapore, as many of you have heard. He also serves on the Economic Strategy Committee of Singapore, Ding Yun's support for innovation and social impact was instrumental in making today's forum possible. Welcome, Ding Yun. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next. I also like to introduce to you, representing the tech panel, Ding Dongming Chen. Ding Chen is the Dean of School of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and the Director of the Office of Business Development of Science and Technology of Peking University. Ding Chen has extensive technology innovation and entrepreneur experience. He founded Meridia in Silicon Valley, California, where he raised US 80 million tier one venture funds, and that was a lot of money in those times when the dollar was a lot stronger, as you know, okay. And later successfully licensed the company's portfolio of IPs to a major foundry in Asia. Welcome, Ding Chen. And next to Ding Chen, our third panelist on the high tech panel is Dr. Zhang C. Lee. Dr. Lee is the chairman of the Development Center for Biotechnology, a nonprofit organization that aims at accelerating Taiwan's biopharmaceutical developments. Dr. Lee has also served as the president of the famed Taiwan Industrial Technology Research Institute, ITRI, Gong Yan Yuan, with a key role in the development of Taiwan's world class high tech industries. Itri has cultivated over 70 CEOs in the local high-tech industry and has incubated 15 successful IPO companies. <coughs> Welcome, Dr. Lee. Welcome. Now let me introduce to you our honorable social impact panel. I'll start with the gentleman to my left. Okay. Representing the social impact panel is Professor Jasper Sorensen. Professor Sorensen is the Robert Elizabeth Jeffy Professor of Organizational Behavior in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Professor Sorensen is also the Faculty Director of the Center for Social Innovation and, newly, and, and also the newly launched Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies, which aims to address the needs of the poor in developing economies by helping entrepreneurial ventures to scale and grow. It's an honor to have you, Professor Sorensen. Okay. Also representing the social impact panel is Dr. Frank Levinson. Dr. Levinson is the founder and managing director of Small World Group, which some of you have, I'm sure, heard about, which invests in early stage startups and social ventures. Dr. Levinson is an active venture investor and serves on multiple boards, both public and private, of companies that focus on clean technology. Welcome, Dr. Levinson. Okay. And our third panelist on the social impact panel 
is Mr. Vineet Rai. Mr. Rai has over 17 years of experience in leading innovative interventions in development sectors across venture capital, microenterprises, microfinance investment, and social investment banking. He is the founder and CEO of Avankar, Avishkar, I should say, Avishkar. I know what it means. It means to explore and to discover of Avishkar Venture Management Service, an asset management company that focuses on rural India. Mr. Rai is also the recipient of the G20 SME Finance Award and the World Business Award. Wow. It's, uh, <laughs> it took us a lot of effort to bring these uh, esteemed practitioners, scholars, and pioneers together, and uh, we're really looking forward to this afternoon's forum. So this is how we're going to start. We will begin with each panelist giving you a few minutes of background of what they do, uh, their strength, successes, and also, very importantly, their challenges moving forward, okay? To set the stage and to familiarize you with your respective uh, businesses. And from there, we will move on with a panel discussion and also with an open floor Q&A, okay? So I think without further ado, then we will start with Ding Yun, who would give us opening remarks. Um, is this on? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me first start thanking everyone for being here. Uh, I want to thank the Deanery of Stanford Graduate School of Business for supporting this event and all our Stanford faculty members who fly long distance to be here. Mm -hmm. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank our many distinguished speakers. Uh, we have already engaged ourselves in a, in a day and a half of discussions and thank you for your wisdom and sharing and input. And also I want to thank everyone who, is, who, who may be listening through the internet from all corners of the world and our guests from Singapore. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, I am not a practitioner in doing incubator. Actually, I've done no research in incubation. So I just want to make a simple general comment. Commercialization of innovation will be big in Asia, but there will be a lot of challenges. It will take a village, government, university, and selfless corporate leaders to overcome these challenges. That will be my overall theme. Why would the commercialization of innovation be big in Asia? We have seen a lot of data, but simply put, we just need it. We have four billion peoples in Asia, all with very high growth aspiration. Very simple arithmetic, if it's in the next five years or so, everyone gain another 2,000 US dollar. That is an eight trillion dollar economy. How are we going to find the resources to deal with this? The only answer is to commercialize innovation, to lift up the resources constraint. Governments know it, corporate leaders know it, we all know it, and the profit incentive will call us to do it. So I'm very confident and I'm very optimistic. Maybe that's why I moved from New York to here. <laughs> However, you know, let's think about it. Commercialization of innovation follows some simple principles. We want people with ideas, take risk to commercialize. And we want them to have money to commercialize and the capabilities to overcome the entry barriers. But that is a lot easier said than done. There exists capability gap, there exists information gap. Our day and a half round table discussions vividly point out that we need a very good ecosystem. It boils down to two points. We need financing agents, people with money, who will part their money to people with idea, but not enough money, but their ideas are worth investing. And we also need the presence of related capabilities. People with ideas need help. They need the help to commercialize, to enter the market, to build up the business practice and prevail. An ecosystem 
it's essential to keep the financing agents, all these related capabilities and the innovators together. So that's why we need industry parks, we need universities, we need incubators, we need NGOs, super NGOs, VCs, and PEs. There exists a lot of challenge to be effective. And each location in our past a day and a half come up with something fascinating to overcome this. And I don't have anything specific to offer. However, I look at Glenn in front of me. He's a distinguished sociologist. And Jasper on my far left is also a sociologist. And my wife is a sociologist. Every night she whispered to my ear about sociology. <laughs> So I think actually there's something very fundamental. It's more than all just this thing. We need some fundamental general behavioral track in order to have a vibrant commercialization of innovations. We need people with curiosity, people who dare to see match between technology, science, and market opportunities, and have the nerve and have the gut, not afraid of risk, and take it. And we need trust in society. Investors need to be able to trust, and we want them to trust entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs need to trust subordinates and partners. Customers need to trust new process and new products. And at the end, we also want all these people to practice fair economics, a term that I heard yesterday. It's fascinating. I love, I love that term. Investors will demand fair return. People will put in their honest hard work, and the fruit of hard work is honestly redistributed to people involved. The question is how to develop these behavioral traits. In my opinion, it takes a village. I'll start with education because I'm the dean. Asia has a very exam and grade conscious culture. Sometimes it drives me nuts. It takes a lot of fun out of studying. It takes a lot of fun out of learning. At worst, it kills curiosity. We want our people to be curious and willing to connect the dots. So at the university level, we have to work extremely hard to change our faculty governance. The next time when I see a faculty member, I don't want to ask him, what is the latest tier one publication? I want to ask him. What is the latest interesting research work? Share with me. When my kid come home, and parents, please listen, she would tell me, hey, Dad, I got 90. I'm not going to ask her how you lose the 10 points. But I'll ask her, what is the latest interesting you learn in school? Share with your parents. I think we need to do a lot of all this. The government. We really need the government to nurture the development of an economic system that establish, respect, and protect rights. When we have transparent rules of the game, investors' rights are well-defined and protected. People will cheat less. We need to protect the investors' fruits. We need to reduce entry barriers. We need to suppress rent seeking. We need to tame corruption and chronism. If so, people will be motivated to innovate, not fearing that their fruit will be captured by some big tycoon or big government connected parties. Such a government is pro market. It leads to the development of a thick market, and a thick market is very important. It gives people alternatives, and when we have alternatives, we specialize and we will take risk. In fact, I really like the Singapore academic environment because there are alternatives. My faculty members will specialize, and if they don't like me, they will walk, and that is a good thing. And now, at the end, I have to serve them well. I really think that we need to have a pro-market government that develop the market, in the end, encourage people to specialize and take risk. The other thing about a thick market is that in a thick market, reputation become important. 
people will care to behave honestly. They will be more trusting and they will behave in a trustworthy manner. This, the curiosity and trust are the things that drive the innovation. And individuals, the corporate leaders among ourselves, we need to practice to be selfless leaders. In corporate finance, we say a lot about you know, agency behavior. A lot of this focus on the transactional relationship between us and the society. But we also talk about private benefit. That is actually about the internal value we have in our system. So am I going to cheat my shareholders? It's more than whether I can cheat and get away with it. But actually it's about, do I want to do such a bad thing? The internal value is also very important. So I feel that we need to provide, the corporate leaders should provide the leadership to drive up the delivery of good internal value. If so, we'll be, we will be fair. Innovations will not be just for making money, but for the joy of making good things happen. Asia needs innovation in a hurry. It takes a village of leaders from the education sector, from the government, and the corporations. Let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ding Yun. And uh, we've uh, maybe strategically placed uh, uh, Peking University next to NUS and on the topic of high tech and also accelerating social impact and also on the attitude and the vision towards education, uh, we're very eager to hear from Ding Chen. Thank you, Professor Wen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon with all of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, NUS School Business School and uh, Stanford Business School for hosting a uh, very informative forum and a panel discussion this afternoon on a subject of great importance in a time where the world is looking for new ideas to generate another round of economic growth. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly so from China's perspective. As you, China in 2010 surpassed Japan to be the world's second largest economy with a total output, GDP output about six trillion dollars. And recently in the 18th Communist Congress, a communist China announced that by 2020, China would double its GDP, which means by 2020, China will produce $12 trillion. And this is a huge number. How do we get there? Well, obviously to get there, we had to do it by innovation. China clearly recognized we cannot continue such a high growth rate at expense of our environment at expense of our social value, and at expense of our health of our citizens. So as you notice, in the 18th Congress, China now has put building a be beautiful China as one of the very important themes in the next round of the economic development. That means Chinese government taking environmental conditions or repair if we want at a very, very serious day. So today, Chinese innovation, according to World, uh, UN's uh, World Information, uh, Intellectual Property Organization rating, China's index, innovation index is rated only at number 34. Yet Singapore is rated number three. So I wanna congratulate all of you. Singapore is actually a very innovative country or island. However, over 20 years of rapid development, China has built a very, very strong advanced manufacturing country. So according to WIPO, the Innovation Efficiency Index, China rated number one. So now, the effort obviously is to move China way up from number 34, hopefully within top 10. That's the government call for that transformation in the next uh, eight years. By 2020, it had to be there. And this is the main drive force to continue able to fill 
seven to eight percent uh, GDP growth. So guarantee you'll get to a double GDP by 2020 from 2010. So as a leading university like Peking University, what should we do? Continuously increasing the government putting more pressure on our university that you gotta do more for the country. The fact that China now rated the number 34 in innovation is a fact because we have been relying on importing technology, assembly nice processes, and we build a very beautiful manufacturing country. But our innovation capability and infrastructures actually has been neglected in the last 20 years. Government obviously recognized the importance to accelerate that development, puts a lot of pressure for the university to help country to achieve that. So as a university, what do you do? As I'm a practitioner, and I, unlike Dean, but now I'm a practitioner, so my job at the Peking University is to figure out how can we realistically create an infrastructure or a platform, you will, to enable university to make a significant contribution to the national economic growth. Uh, today, all the spin-off add together in China, it amounts to revenue of less than 4% in Chinese economy. In other words, it's really very small percentage. So there's a huge space, huge opportunity that we can change that. Obviously, the university role is to educate students to uh, uh, doing exploratory research, not really doing the industrial job. But nevertheless, in a situation in China today, if we don't make more contribution to help in, uh, the country to build an innovative system and infrastructure, who else is going to do that? So this is burden, at least partially, uh, rests on the shoulder of university. So in Peking University, we, uh, in a, uh, unlike a conventional university technology transfer, uh, we now <coughs> expand our licensing, IP licensing, or corporate sponsored research tool, uh, helping regional government build their innovation centers, mostly the incubators. So in the last two or three years, we have built about half dozen incubators throughout China, and we uh, will continue to do so. Probably in the next couple of years, we will build about more than a dozen incubators. <coughs> and that means we have to create a new talent to do all the innovation work. We need talent to manage these incubators successfully. So I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to learn from so many experts from Silicon Valley <coughs> and from the rest of the Asia uh, region. <coughs> so in our incubators, uh, we actually, uh, some of the incubators are designed uh, with a focus on technology sectors. For example, in Nanjing, we build a pharmaceutical uh, innovation center uh, we do that because that's the area being designated as a Nanjing pharmaceutical industrial uh, park. So many pharmaceutical companies in those regions. Uh, in Dongguan, Guan, Guangdong, Dongguan, we build a photonic centers because there are a lot of uh, photonic industries in those regions, and they are desperately looking for technology <coughs> to elevate their um, their corporate earning. <coughs> Also, uh, in Mongolia and in Jiangxi uh, area, we build incubators uh, based on the fact that these regions have abundant rare earth materials, which is uh, very, very expensive. And China uh, uniquely has that reserve, uh, special reserve. We have to help these regions not to sell raw material at a lower price, rather to create value-added technology to processing this material to pure elements, and even to component, so they can generate more economic benefit from the resources they have locally. Now, China is very big, the economy is huge, and given the, the today's ability for university to do all the innovation, we can really sustain the seven, eight percent growth. Like in the past, I think in the foreseeable future, China still need to import or work with the rest of the world to bring in many, many new and uh, creative innovations, technologies to support this growth. So we also 
at university, we also create a special incubators to uh, specialize, uh, focus on global technology transfer and incubation. We hope to use this platform to work with the universities like our sister uh, university, Stanford, uh, Stan University in Europe, in Japan, in Asia, to bring technology into China. After all, China is the world's largest manufacturing country. A better technology we can source to these, uh, these corporations, a better product they can build, and better earth they can build at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dean Chen. And in your efforts of uh, doubling your incubators from six to 12 and learning that experience uh, uh, in a multiple, you know, cross-cultural, um, multinational kind of ways, we've strategically put the gentleman who's run incubators next to you, but he's from Taiwan, and there's lots of experience to be leveraged from Taiwan. Dr. Lee? Thank you. Um, Taiwan has done uh, quite uh, has, has made significant progress in uh, high-tech uh, industry development in the past 20 years. Um, we are more focused on semiconductor IT related industry and uh, as you some of you probably know that um, we have incubated many companies from grassroots uh, of uh, small uh, companies in Taiwan, and uh, some of them has exceeded $10 billion uh, US dollars per year's uh, revenue. Uh, now is a very big global com company. Uh, and those experience in incubating companies that are mostly from supply chain side of the technology has been uh, practiced uh, through the cooperation uh, between government and nonprofit organizations like ITRI, as well as private sectors, and those are many. Ex there are many experiences that we can <coughs> share with other countries, and we have learned a great deal from other countries, especially from Silicon Valley. But other than the high-tech semiconductor and IT industry, we have to look forward to the future, and one of the so-called strategic industry uh, is certainly biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry. And the organization that I'm working with is primarily set up to develop and accelerate the development of Taiwan's biotechnology industry. Uh, biotechnology incubation is very different from other uh, industry. Uh, and, and certainly incubation, as we have learned in the past two days, is a very complicated uh, and, and depends uh, largely on the nature of the technology and nature of the business, as well as your outside environment. Asia, Taiwan is certainly different from Silicon Valley. Uh, there is a uh, great deal of infrastructure inefficient deficiency uh, that, that exists in, in every, almost every country in Asia. And in Taiwan, for biotechnology industry, it's still uh, in the early stage. For biotechnology industry, uh, especially in pharmaceutical, uh, as many of you know that, that it typically uh, takes very long time to, uh, to uh, develop a product and commercialize them. It has to go through from discovery to preclinical to phase one, phase two, phase three uh, clinical uh, development. And also it, it, it uh, consumes a large sum of money uh, in the process. And it's a very high risk business. Therefore, uh, many of the startup company cannot really carry all the way through all the steps to the end of commercialization. So typically, there are many um, biotechnology startups are in the early stage. They are pre-revenue. They, they're not generating any revenue, and they're still doing uh, product development and research. So for those early stage companies, it's very uh, high uh, science, scientific-based uh, startups. The incubation requires a lot more than the traditional uh, incubation. It requires not just 
to provide the facilities and services and facilitating the networking. But also, you almost have to go out creating the companies, identifying good projects and, and hire and help also for the, to uh, financing them and um, help to grow and manage the company. So it, I call it a proactive incubation of these early stage companies. And that requires a, a great deal of effort. So in Taiwan, uh, we are uh, incorporating this incubation mechanism into a biomedical science park, uh, try to leverage all the facilities uh, inside the, the park, including some of the co common uh, labs and also the co facilities in preclinical toxicology test, clinical uh, trial uh, hospitals, uh, and also other, um, uh, other services such as um, the uh, legal and, and other uh, financial services together. So this incubation really requires uh, a coupling of many different things other than park financing uh, and also the uh, legal and, and other services together. And uh, that takes a, a great deal of more effort than, than we do in the past. Uh, this uh, incubation uh, mechanism uh, is still uh, not enough because we need to focus on certain area and we're focusing on the late phase of research and early phase of development. And that's the part that, that we believe that Taiwan has uh, a specialized um, uh, strength to, uh, to, to bridge the gap and bring out the value. And uh, we have been incorporating that mechanism for last five, six years. Uh, so far, we have incubated uh, about 45 companies, and uh, this takes much longer than we used to uh, think. And, but so far, we have been lucky that have two of them uh, start the beginning from the beginning with us, and they are uh, they have successfully uh, IPO'd, and also uh, two are in preparation. So I think uh, this is the our uh, early experience with the biotechnology, and because uh, I've seen that most of the Asian country does not have a complete ready uh, ecosystem for the early stage scientific based uh, incubations. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, to rely on a more uh, proactive uh, approach to incubate those early stage companies. And it is b because of that that I think the government will play a crucial role, uh, that their support and long-term commitment is very important. And also uh, we have to uh, connect and learn and network with international communities. And that is also, again, very important. In the last uh, three to four years, we have seen the first tunnel, first light in the tunnel, that the Taiwan's uh, biotech uh, industry has been growing uh, in, a, in a very uh, vibrant mode. Uh, the market capitalization of the biotechnology and pharmaceutical sector uh, has grown about 400% from uh, roughly um, three billion U.S. dollars to now about ten, exceeding ten billion U.S. dollars in last three and a half years. So uh, we hope this momentum can be continued with our efforts, and I hope uh, that we will be able to share some of our uh, experience in this high-tech area with others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. So I think from the high-tech panel, what we have picked up is uh, driving the continued growth, if not even more, doubling the GDP growth for China uh, through innovation, through technology, and the support is varied in terms of levels, uh, different stages of incubation, and also, end of the day, the um, government support that uh, Dr. Lee talked about is crucial. Let's change gears a little bit. I'm gonna change to the social impact uh, panel, and uh, maybe starting off with talking about 
what is that picture like or how does that happen for the de developing economies or whatever you have on your <laughs> notes, we can cover those too. Yeah, you could read them. So. Oh, uh, Professor Sorensen. So thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and to have everybody here. So, uh, so I, I've been given a, a topic which is called incubating s for social impacts. And mm -hmm. as I think about that, I think there are, there are three tricky words in that topic, and there's only four words. And so um, one is incubating. What do we mean by incubating? The other one is social, and what is impact, right? So I mean, even if we collapse social impact into one, we have a problem. But I think there's, there's so, so, so the first question is kind of what do we mean by social impact, right? And I think it's actually a little bit related to the problem of incubation, I think. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about that and then say what we're, kind of how we're thinking about it at, at the Stanford GSB and some of the initiatives that we're kind of undergoing or trying to undertake right now. So, you know, I think in general you can think about a social impact problem or a social innovation problem or a social enterprise problem as being about trying to solve some sort of market failure that, that people kind of uh, are seeing some sort of social welfare be being left at the wayside. And there's some sort of market failure that people want to address in some way and, 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 and speak to. Um, the problem, of course, um, the paradox with the market failure is that we really like market-based solutions. And, but the nature of a market failure means that the market isn't going to solve the problem, is not going to resolve the failure by itself. And so then the question is, how do we figure out a way to, 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 to address that using non-market solutions in a way that doesn't ultimately get in the way of the ability of market-based solutions to, to involve? And I actually think this is where the connection to incubation comes in, because I think this is what incubators do in general, right? They're, they're kind of trying to, to, to spot opportunities that nobody's taking advantage of yet and then figure out a way to get it, get the ball rolling. And so uh, one of the interesting things about Stanford, you know, we're located in kind of the heart of where everybody thinks in innovation and incubation is kind of the epicenter of everything like that. And so Stanford at the GSB, we kind of pride ourselves on the idea that we know something about this and we know what we're talking about. Um, and, of course, what, what happens is that we know a lot about doing it in the context of Silicon Valley. And I think one of the things that we've, we've learned over the last several years is that we had tried to extend our knowledge and our thinking about these things to, to other contexts. Uh, we, we've become more humble, and I think, in, but in a productive way and in a way that's good for, for a university and, a, and an educational institution. And so one, way, one reason I say this is my experience over the past uh, uh, slightly more than a year working with a new institute at the GSB called the Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies. Uh, we call it SEED for short. Um, SEED was founded through a very generous gift from an alum, Bob King and his wife Dottie, and um, with the very ambitious goal of using uh, the, 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 the resources and the capabilities uh, and the tools of the Stanford and the business school at Stanford in particular to help address uh, uh, the needs of the extreme poor in, in, in developing economies. And um, that's, that's a big problem. And we're a small school, and so uh, there's been a lot of challenges in thinking about how exactly um, um, to do that. Uh, one of the very unusual things about, about SEED is that it, it, it very much has as a kind of a founding principle an idea that uh, we can't solve this problem sitting alone in Silicon Valley. Um, and that we can't solve this problem simply by sending people from Silicon Valley to Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and, and other developing contexts and have them come back and tell us what the solution is. There's something to be learned by that, but I think for a large extent, as we talked about this morning in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the panel, I think a lot of what the benefit of those kinds of initiatives are, are around what the ways in which the student education is improved, but it doesn't necessarily have impact on the ground in the way that we might might hope. And so SEED has been very committed to the idea of setting up an on-the-ground presence. And so our goal is to actually set up uh, what we call hubs uh, in, in, in different regions. And we're, 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 our, our, our plan at this point is to start in Africa. And the idea of these hubs is to use these as uh, essentially focal points for which we can interface with uh, entrepreneurs and managers who are working to uh, provide goods and services that address the needs of the poor or uh, who are uh, 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 trying to employ the, the poor in their own production process and help them address the problems that they need to address in order to, to scale and grow. From our perspective, there's an enormous benefit because we are confident that we're going to learn a lot about 
what we think management is and how management works and how it becomes more successful. But I think there's also just a very important part about the about thinking about the, the incubation part of it, which is that we don't really necessarily know what we're doing here. And I think we we kind of go into the, the whole process with we have a very clear sense of what our strengths are. Uh, but we don't have a clear sense of how those strengths are going to work in the particular context in which we want them to work. And so I think this is, again, um, really an incubation process. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to incubate local environments and incubate kind of ecosystems in a lot of the ways that we've talked about um, <coughs> by being present on the ground, by working with the entrepreneurs, by walking with the entrepreneurs, by, look, by, by working with the local players in the ecosystem and really trying to figure out how it's going to work and not just think that we can take the models and the solutions that we think work in the context of high tech uh, you know, software companies in Silicon Valley and transplant them willy-nilly into, into the local context. So uh, we're very much, you know, enthusiastic about uh, the kinds of conversations that we've been having here because it's really a way for us to learn a lot and to, to, to talk to partners and to talk to people like the other people on the panel here who are actually doing this and, and, and to learn a lot from them. So uh, that's a little bit about where we're coming from or where I'm coming from and so I'll just step back there. Thank you, Professor Sorensen. That, that's exciting to hear, and we'll definitely be coming back to talking about the needs for the extreme poor. Next to you, we have a true practitioner, <coughs> Dr. Levinson. <coughs> Can you introduce to us about Small World, what you do, and the success and challenges? Sure, thank you. Great. Um, so I know many of you in the audience from Singapore have heard that, that it's the goal of the government here to, to try to transform the, the Singapore economy from a, a skills-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. And as, as a small part of that, they hired some midwives. And, and Small World Group is one of them. We are a, an incubator that's partnered with the Singapore National Research Foundation. They're our funding partners. In, a, in a, honestly, an innovative scheme for this part of the world. There have been many attempts to, to start incubators throughout the world, and I'm familiar with some of them. Many of them have government money, in, but they have government panels that, that administer them and tell the, where the money will go and so on. In this scheme, essentially, they hired people with a, some venture capital experience, and when we bring them a deal, we co-fund based on our decision. Now, there's a challenge in all that. Many of the schemes also have had ways that the incubators could operate themselves, and by charging fees for some of the money they invest and so on. In our scheme, we don't make a dime until the companies we invest in actually succeed and either go public or get bought, and so on. So unless we create solid businesses, businesses that, that grow and, and produce real profits, essentially all Singapore did was have a job program and I put up part of the money. So we're very focused on results and outputs. And, and in that context, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. We invest in, in the areas of clean tech because we think in this part of the world that, that, that uh, things that are developed even in other parts of the world can, can find new applications here. We invest in optics because that's my background and, and in special materials. Um, and we also invest in social ventures, which means we've looked at, at, at a number of ideas that, that, uh, that have impact, that were judged to have impact by outside rating agencies even and so on. We're partnered with a Singapore group called the Asian Impact Investment Exchange, which is a husband and wife team that received some Rockefeller grant money and then, and then has set up a, an organization to really try to help the, the social ventures part of this here. And we funded our first one this year out of uh, NUS, to, which is uh, uh, some, some young folks that, that uh, have started uh, a training program in rural Philippines to educate uh, young women to uh, participate in call centers. In fact, it's been very effective. Some of them have been hired and promoted even to supervisory roles. Uh, so it's, it's a clearly a, been, a, been an exciting thing for us to do. Uh, this is my entire prepared remarks compared to people that have tablets, so I'm almost done. But, but I will say one other thing. There's a number of people in the audience. There's a couple <coughs> other incubator managers. But the person I really credit with, with starting the program that I'm participating in, this, this technology incubation scheme, is in the audience today. He's Francis Yeo, who was the CEO of NRF when, I, when it started. He's moved from that position, I now, to new, to new things. And he is a professor here as well, part-time. But I'd like to say I think he was, he was really critical in, in starting the program that we're in and, and helping us uh, with this innovation inside Singapore. So, to me. Thanks, Francis. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Thank you. 
Mr. Rai, it was fascinating to hear you talk this morning. I learned a lot about Avishkar, and I, I can't wait for you to share that with our audience. Okay, I think uh, uh, I actually don't have even that small thing, so I'll try to <laughs> last faster. But let me actually try to give you a bit of a history. I started in 2001. India in 2001 was growing at around 6%. Uh, the GDP was growing by 6%. Uh, we are close to a billion people, not a very large population. 30% uh, of that large population was actually responsible for a large percentage of that 6%. 70% that lives in rural India was largely not participating in that growth. Uh, as a 29, 30 year old guy, I actually thought I have a great opportunity. The reason why people don't want to deal with this 700 million people is because they are actually uh, difficult, there's a lot of risk involved, and I saw it as an opportunity because 700 million people is a large number. Any business in that area would actually create value. Uh, no competition, nobody wants to invest. So if I manage to collect capital, I might actually become a billionaire. Uh, with this bright idea, I quit my job uh, and tried to raise capital. Started with $100, uh, made a world record. Five years later, 2005 December, I crossed a million dollar. And uh, in the process, learned what venture capital means, how difficult it is to raise capital, and risk really means risk, not opportunity. Having said that, around 2006, 7, uh, I became smarter. Uh, people started trusting me. And by 2007, I jumped from 1 million to 33 million, and, uh, and that's basically the highlight of my career. Having said that, uh, because there were things on highlights and successes, so where do we stand? Uh, the success is that we have reached $150 million by 2012. Uh, the fact that it took me five years to 1 million and 150 million in the next five years means I've learned something. Uh, those $150 million, we have deployed around $60 million in around 40 enterprises. Uh, of those 40 enterprises, 10 enterprises have gone completely bust, uh, but 30 remain. Of those 30, we have actually exited four at, uh, at returns ranging from 145% to 65% and 45%. Some of these IRR are at fairly long time range, so I have actually exited a company I invested eight years back with a 45% IRR and one at 65% IRR, which means I have been able to demonstrate that not only can you invest, build value, as well as exit, and in the process, we have created thousands of women and people who are living in remote rural areas becomes owner of some of these businesses. Not just participating in value creation, not just creating jobs, a large number of them actually own these companies. I'm not saying creating ownership to poor people is really the only way to create impact, but it's actually just one of the ways of doing it. Not all my companies do that, but we provide all kinds of uh, potential solutions from agriculture, education, health, etc. In the process, you are trying to offer things at a cheaper rate, uh, possibly in the reducing the risk of people going back into poverty or far deeper poverty than they were. Uh, challenges, a uh, lot of challenges, uh, but I will not look back, I'll look forward. So at 150 million, my target is to actually go to a billion. The challenge that we face, the first and most important challenge is actually how do you convince more LPs to understand what I'm doing. Remember that I have only made four exits, not 40. And had I made 40 exits, possible it's easier. So we need to actually demonstrate that's a big challenge. Uh, the other challenge that I actually foresee is how to harmonize the idea of return with impact. Now, uh, there was a lot of discussion we had in the morning, how if you are trying to make impact, you should make low returns, which actually is counterintuitive to me because I don't really know if I'll make returns when I'm making an investment nor do I know the entrepreneur who is taking money from me will finally make impact. So to make decisions about both impact and returns before you have actually done that sounds counterintuitive to me, but very intelligent people find it very difficult to agree with me. Uh, it's a challenge that I'll need and I have actually requested standard Stanford faculty and NUS faculty to help communicate this and help me actually articulate and communicate this better to people who are far more intelligent and far more experienced in these areas. So going forward, we are looking to actually, as I said, target is to raise a billion dollar, make 300 investments, and hopefully demonstrate that uh, venture capital is not a uniform uh, opportunity, nor is actually poor people a very homogeneous cluster class. You need to actually use different methodologies, different ways of dealing with them. And in the process, you can create value, both for yourself, for the world, and possibly, and I'm not sure whether we will alleviate poverty completely, but we can deal with the problem of poverty to some extent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Thank you. 
Uh, many of our audience have uh, sent in questions uh, during, uh, with, along with your registration. So I think there's actually one that's perfect, and it comes with uh, what you mentioned, Mr. Ryan, in terms of harmonizing returns with impact. That's, uh, that's very interesting. So I'm going to throw this, if my tech panel does not mind, I will direct the first question to my social impact panel. Along the line of what you said, harmonizing returns with impact, in your assessment, how should social entrepreneurship startups balance between commercial pressure, commercial competitive pressure, with the mission of delivering social impact? In other words, commercial pressures and social impact, you know, do you see them as uh, conflicting one another? Or could they possibly complement one another? I think, Mr. Rai, I think no, I know your answer. I don't know if we shall start with you, but I leave it open with the social impact panel. So the short, so the short answer to that is, is that there is no, if you're doing charity and people are just giving away money, that's one thing. But if you're trying to create a business that has sustainability, hmm. the only way you get that is with profit. And, it, it, and so profit can't be a bad word. It can't be that, that we sacrifice profit or the commercial side of the venture in order to achieve uh, some impact. Mm -hmm. It is that, that, that the harmony is that, that without a profitable venture, it simply won't continue. And if we believe we're, we're really meeting a social need, we're creating employment, whatever we're doing, it has to be done in a profitable way in order to be sustained. So um, I think it's, it's obviously a, a very difficult question. I mean, I think it's one that keeps uh, a lot of people talking for a very long time. So, and we'll try to avoid that, I guess. But um, you know, the way I think about it, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy to, to, to what, to what Vinit and Frank, what, uh, the viewpoint that they're kind of advocating. I think it, the intuition is the right one. I think maybe one way to think about this is uh, you know, that, that while we call something social impact, what we're really trying to say is it's something that we value. Right, and so, and so you see this particularly in kind of the tension between you know somebody who's trying to do something in impact who is based in Silicon Valley and wants to have the impact somewhere else. But what they're basically saying is, I want this other place to be more like the way I think the world should be, and so it's their values. Um, and I think where the tension then comes in organizations is between, you know, where the tension between the mission and the profit motive becomes is, well, you know, if it turns out that your values are the same as the market's values, then you're good, right? Then there is no tension between the two. But, but if it turns out that your values are different from the market's values, then, then you have a problem. And so I think that's the, that's the question, right? And there's a, there's a deep, I think, philosophical question or ethical question about whether you get to impose it or not. And I think everybody has to make, come down on their own side on that question. But, um, I think that's the essential tension that we that we wrestle with, right? And you know, you can you can keep imposing your values, but then at some point it does become charity, right? And and that doesn't make it wrong. It just but you have to be clear about what it is you're doing. Right? And taking that very various philosophical to your end of what you have done, maybe you could share with in, with us in terms of the projects and. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to give two examples just to exemplify. So first, I actually. Believe, do believe there is actually always a tension between the commercial side and the social impact. And that's, but I'll give you two examples. One example is actually a company called Fab India, not my investing company, I invested in its supply chain. Uh, and most likely today we'll have a swap, well Fab India would actually uh, give us shares in Fab India in return to the investments I made in the downstream. So what do we do? We basically invest in a company that has actually thousands of women who actually live in very remote parts of India own it. Not only does this company actually help these people become owners, but actually also is a buyer of the product they produce and sell it to Fab India, which is actually the front end. And in the process creates value, and I make a little money, so does the poor women. Now, what does Fab India do? Fab India actually is basically a very specialized front end that actually opens retail shops, uh, shops and sell this, and there is a very large, uh, uh, very large population that buys it. And the more Fab India opens stores, the more it sells, the more people get employed, the more people can join these companies. Overall, the more profit Fab India makes, the more chances are thousands and thousands more people will actually get employed. Now, in case Fab India actually gets greedy and starts squeezing the small company that I was running, most of us will go bankrupt. But then if you ask Fab India, one of the biggest risks that Fab India is faced with is while it can open retail chains because it knows it very well, it is not a strength to actually go down to the poor person and make them handicraft workers. So it's actually a fear. Not having a proper backward integration is actually a fear with which they live. So if Fab India wants to be a sustainable business, it's not bright for them 
to squeeze and kill the back end. So it's actually business sense for them that they actually create impact at the bottom. Having said that, if you actually are a company that actually makes a product that actually supplies, takes a product to the poor people at a certain price, and you are actually a monopoly, that means you actually have, uh, have all rights to sell this price at any product, but you are driven by a promoter who actually wants to sell it at a lower price, and then suddenly you actually have a private equity investor who actually say, who was told? And I, as a promoter, went and made a presentation to him, saying, by the way, there are six billion people in the world, two billion people are poor, my product can go to two billion people, I have no competition, therefore, if I sell at 10% margin, I'll give you an IPO in two years' time. And then something changes, and a competitor actually comes on the horizon. And then at that point of time, you start actually trying to push your price up in order to actually capture more market so that you're more profitable, you still want to give an IPO. In the process, you have actually moved away. Create profit, but you have created this tension because you have actually reduced the value for which you existed. And I think, therefore, it's actually, as Professor said, it's actually a choice that every individual has to make with what opportunity you went to the investor and what the story you told him, if you can't stick to that story, because investors do not make decisions. They only participate in the decision or the story that is told to them. And then it is the opportunity, how it was defined and how it creates conflicts, it's left to that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think so there are rights and wrong answers. Microfinance in India taught us that the most right answer can actually be perceived as the most wrong answer. So I don't think so there are right and wrong answers. These are challenges that can only contextually be solved. Mm -hmm. So there are no single answers there. It's right a answer. good answer yes. though, it's a great answer. I would like to chime in here. I think here's where corporate governance matter a lot. I think transparencies and valid performance measure is very important. Let me start in the following way. Sitting among us are many faculty members. They can, go pri they can go to the market and provide consulting service or work for a company, and they can make a lot more money than serving as an academic. And for them, there's a trading off between market return and internal return. And they balance the two. They have no problem. Why? Because there's no corporate governance issues before them. They are responsible for what they are doing. And they know the performance measure, and everything is transparency within them. But when you blow it up to a corporation, then it will be the issue about investors, whether they agree with the CEO or the board using the corporate money for social good. And some people do not necessarily like, I want my return. They may agree with what's going on. However, if they don't know what they are do, what, what is doing, when the transparency is not there, when the performance measure is not there, then that's where the problem lies. Um, so my belief, and actually in NUS Business School, we have a center called Asia Centers for Social Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy. And we work very hard on p improving the research on the transparency and performance measures for the nonprofit organizations. And I think that this is an important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Bernie, because I'm sorry, Dean Yuan, I'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, yes, he's, he's uh, very personable to his uh, faculty. Let, let, let me uh, target over to our high-tech panel, okay? And we'll just cut through the chase and say, you know, how realistic is it? Is it realistic for the high-tech incubators and upcoming uh, uh, new startups to be concerned with the base of the pyramid needs? You know, when obviously, when, you know, there's a, an issue on affordability, but they may not be your customers, they, they may not be the segment that you target. So when you design, when you innovate, how realistic is it to expect that you, um, you know, be concerned with the uh, social impact needs or the base of the pyramid needs? Well, I'd, I'd take uh, first. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Let's look at the uh, computer industry in the past. They have made the computer from big computers smaller and smaller cheaper and cheaper so that most of the more and more people can, can benefit and can use that. As Bill Clinton just mentioned in his speech, cell phone it means freedom to many people now. In many countries, cell phones are exceeding the access to internet. So along the way, they made more people access to their, um, their freedom and their, their capability, but they also made a lot of money. Mm. So in that sense, it is also have a large social impact. Um, I, I, I think it's just that you're targeting from the top down 
beginning with uh, the, the upper part of the pyramid, and then you're addressing trickle down to the base part of the pyramid. Where on the left side of the panel today, I think I, I made their success, and I think they are trying to tackle from the base part of the pyramid, which is a lot more difficult. And I think the major difficulty is that you don't get as much talents mm. to help you to develop everything from from the lower part of the pyramid. And that's that's very difficult. So if we can get more talent to help in that direction, I think it's just as, as much as a good business opportunity as a social impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, let me make you make the comment uh, again related to China. I think it, uh, although uh, I just brag about China has uh, uh, surpassed Japan in the uh, become second world well, second largest GDP, the fact that China is very big, so the gap between the rich and poor are uh, continually being widened. Uh, in Chinese, uh, we talk about 城乡差别. So uh, the policy. Uh, both by the government and the uh, financial market are obviously driven from uh, profit and growth perspective. So a lot of resources are unfairly uh, given to those who are actually not the most needed. And, and this has become a big issue uh, which is going to lead to social instability. Here we talk about social value. But one of the things you know, the China is a huge country. A social instability means the world has a social instability problem. So maintaining the social stability is a, a very critical. And to continue to provide uh, food and shelter to the most needed uh, segment of societies is going to be very important. Uh, I think that China now obviously doesn't have the poverty issue. I think that most people have enough food and have shelter. The next issue will be the health care. Can the uh, lower segment of the population uh, enjoy or have the comparable, we can talk about equal, comparable basic health care uh, uh, resources? And I think it's not going to be an issue. I hope that we certainly, as we are building these incubators, uh, we should keep that in mind to uh, help reduce those gaps. Thank you, Ling Chen. I, I cannot resist the temptation to, try to chime in again. I know I'm being talkative now. But point one, I think the high-tech industry, all the startups, they have already generated a huge amount of social change overall globally. China, Arabian world, everywhere. So consciously or not consciously, what they have produced has benefited mankind. Whether we have the bottom of the pyramid or not, very often it's the market distortion that caused the problem. Let's think about, say, uh, since John Xi is in biotech and so on, let's think about, say, the, the U.S. medical coverage. The medical cost right now is about 17 plus percent GDP. And there are many poor people who are not getting the benefit from the medical profession. And therefore, there's all these discussions about expanding the coverage and so on. We, are, if we have to ask the question. Is there inefficiency? Is it because of the high tech, or is it really because of some policy distortions or market distortions? I, I'm not saying that it, it is as such in the US, but I think very often it's not just the company or the high tech. We have to think about really what is the overall, you know, the policy related and the, and the market related uh, distortion that cause us to ignore some well deserving people's attention. Actually, that's a perfect lead-in to talk about that there was a question submitted regarding what is the most effective role. So it's really on roles and responsibilities. You know, different perceptions, thinking different uh, bodies of organization ought to be doing different things. So we, when we look at the role of the government, the institution, the incubators, the universities, or even you, you know, consumers. When we look at the roles and responsibilities and put that question forth for the social panel and also the high tech panel, you know, how do you see the roles in, in your assessment? You know, how do, what do you believe, you know, to have an effective bridging between technological innovations and social missions? How do you see each of the roles and responsibilities that these different entities should be taking up? I know there's a lot of parties out there, maybe starting out, you know, I think uh, Ding Yun mentioned earlier on government, 
nurturing role, essential pro-market. What about all these bodies? Maybe you could start off talking about the one that you deem that is most important for you to uh, pursue your mission. Your mission. Anyone? So, so that's, uh, I think you're, people are pausing because I think it's a hard question. So, mm -hmm. um, so you know, I would say, um, you know, I think, you know, I do think that it's very important to think about this question because I do think that one of the things that, you know, we, we it's very important to, to do what you know how to do. And I think where people get into trouble in this space is when they start to, they can see an opportunity and they go after it, but even though it's not something that they're kind of specialized to do. So I think, you know, I think we, as we think about what Stanford's role is in these kinds of things, I think we think of it as, you know, we, we're good at, primarily two things, right? We're good at uh, research and, and teaching and uh, various combinations of that. So we try to think about ways in which we can bring that to bear mm -hmm. uh, on the different kinds of solutions. Um, I do think that, again, you there's a role for kind of, I think it's a, a little bit of a question of how much market failure there is, is, is in play here and whether you can, you know, that, you know, to the extent that you need kind of nonprofit or governmental institutions to step in is 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 when there is nobody else in the in the space that will kind of uh, play that role, and I think that um, and and try to provide a bridge to uh, creating enough of a nascent market that you then can stand back and let people kind of specialize and and work with the profit motive to to, to go after those opportunities. <coughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to blend the previous one, the previous question and this one for just a minute. The, um, there are times when technology does that naturally. Uh, the company I started in fiber optics uh, when I was there, I developed a metric for the, the, the amount of product we sold. And it was, we sold product that, that delivered bandwidth. If you, you, you transmitted data with it. And at one point we were selling about one megabit per second of bandwidth per month per person on earth. And that number was growing by 10x every four to five years. What that meant was we were punching down into the bottom of the pyramid without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. that we, because we were making it so cheap that bandwidth was going everywhere. So you had a cell phone, but then it became, could become a smart cell phone because mm -hmm. you could still do that. In the same way, we've watched uh, Indian uh, pharmaceuticals become the generic brand for much of the world. They solve the bottom of the pyramid problem and, and they could sell it throughout the world. And I think the same thing would be true, for example, with medical devices. We think they have to stay expensive, but if someone solves a screening or a diagnostic mm -hmm. tool that could reach the bottom of the pyramid, they'll own the world. Mm -hmm. and, and what a delightful thing. So I think there's lots of ways where that bridge, uh, if you can really use the technology to, to, to leverage yourself like that, that, that's the magic of technology, is it can scale so quickly. And, and there's, there's three examples, for example. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Uh, I, I actually had multiple examples in mind, but I'll actually limit myself to one. Uh, business process outsourcing in India is actually pretty well known. Uh, there are some challenges in business process outsourcing. Uh, one of the reasons it moved from developed world to India was because we had a price advantage, we had a space advantage, but today a business process outsourcing unit in Delhi is one of the highest uh, rental rates, has actually 40% attrition in the industry, 25, 30, 40% attrition. Now if you want to use technology and actually just shift this BPO industry from where it is, where it is facing the same challenges it was facing in the developed countries, uh, to let's say hills in Himalayas and you actually take it to a village uh, where uh, the entire population who will come and work for you will work for life. 30 years, zero attrition. So you dropped attrition to zero. You dropped the cost of rental to almost zero because there's uh, really nobody else wanting to rent anything out in the Himalayas. And you basically are using the broadband that Government of India is laying all across, uh, which is going under the mm -hmm. place in the Himalayas through the villages. Uh, one of my companies has done it, it's called B2R, you can look it up in the websites, it actually has 15 centers. Uh, and one of the advantages is you can take actually very low end data interpretation stuff there. You really don't need to actually do higher end BPO services. But what you have done in the process is use technology to actually uh, create jobs and employment, stop people from migrating from their villages to actually cities. 
have solved a problem of actually doing lower end data stuff by actually creating an opportunity for doing it. Uh, technology can actually bring about a lot of changes. Actually, there are a lot of medical equipment innovations taking place in India. There are companies called Neuroscience Optics, Forus Healthcare. Each one of them have come up with uh, fairly path-breaking innovations, not in terms of the technology per se, but the price points that they have come up with. So the answer is uh, there is actually a big role that technological innovations can play. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good. Uh, we purposely designed the uh, Q&A to allocate, you know, half of the time uh, to answer some of the questions that were submitted along with registration because I know that we asked you for those. And also the other half to have it as an open floor forum for you to ask questions of our panelists. We do have microphones on the side so that our webcast people could uh, catch what, you know, what you say. Um, so I open, right now I open the floor to uh, see if there's any questions in the audience that you might like to ask of our panelists. And I graduated from Stanford's chemical engineering department uh, earlier this January. I'm working at the Institution of Materials Research and Engineering up the hill right now as a research uh, chemist. So my question is actually um, specific to Singapore. Um, uh, what is the incubation scene here like? Um, because um, I guess the, aside from, sorry, I have to refer to, so any, is there any challenges to incubating in Singapore other than the issues such as uh, the lack, or like a generic lack of curiosity and trust that is kind of inherent in uh, any kind of society that's less than free and open um, that uh, one of the speakers had just touched on. Um, so, for example, is there any help needed specifically to identification and expansion in foreign markets? And uh, would it be better for incubators to be local? And also, I know that there are um, successful um, businesses set up in Singapore that have uh, less technological content, such as in the food and fashion industry. And I'm just wondering what those business leaders are doing uh, in terms of contributing to kind of uh, invigorating the startup scene in Singapore. So that's the end of my question. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Levinson or Dean Yuen? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we, we also need to draft the help of Professor Wang Po Kam, who has done a lot of incubation uh, for, for NUS uh, Enterprise. Uh, Frank, you want to? Sure. Um, at least in terms that you asked about markets and, and, and things that are local, I, I think one of the key points about Singapore is, is to not, and one of the things we work with our companies, uh, we do materials, so if you have an idea, please come and see us. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in general, we try to have the companies we start not think of Singapore as their market, but to realize they're within a four-hour plane ride from more than half the world's population in terms of countries. So we want to think of, of the design of the country, of the company you would create as reaching out to this region, which is a very short plane ride. So we try really hard to, to, in the formation process, as you're thinking about and creating and designing the product and where you think it can go, to ask the questions of how do you, how do you reach out to people that are, that are outside of this, this small dot. Before, before I, I ask Paul come to, to help us, let me just voice my opinion. I think that in Singapore, um, I agree with Frank, one of the challenges that we need to motivate people to think about Singapore as a city in a whole big region, that our stage is a lot bigger than just within this island. Number two, we need to encourage Singaporeans to be more risk taking. I think a lot of the challenge is not about people have or not have ideas, but people do not want to take risk. People, we, we need, we really need Singaporeans to be able to more actively connect the dots and try to m be daring to make things happen. Um, the, the incubators and all this, what they, the challenge is that they are not able to find enough local people to work for startup. Not able to find enough local people who are willing to not work for the government, not work for multinationals, but just because of the passion, they want to make things happen and work for the startup or the small and medium-sized enterprise and so on. We want them to be passionate to make things happen. Mm -hmm. I think that is, to me, a very, very major challenge here. Pokam, can you help? 
Well, I guess as Frank has said, uh, the Singapore government through a number of agencies like National Research Foundation and Spring Singapore have actually provided seed funding and also attracted the establishment of, uh, in fact, about 16 uh, technology incubators scheme uh, and you could easily get funding for up to uh, 500, 600,000 if you have a really good business idea and uh, interesting technology. In fact, some of these in, uh, incubator managers is in, is in the room as we speak. So make sure that during the tea break that uh, you, know, uh, you stay around and some of them will talk to you. And NUS itself, we run an incubator for startup and we get seed funding from anything from 50,000 uh, all the way to uh, half a million. And we work very closely with many of these technology incubators uh, and so, uh, I, my sense is that actually over the last two, three years, seed funding is not really the problem now. The problem is that you come up with really interesting uh, technology idea, and there are, I think, enough of uh, experienced angel investors and early stage startup incubation managers that can help you. The challenge is to actually move, be as uh, Frank said, that you need to grow out of Singapore, and the next stage of follow on funding usually will require maybe up to three, four millions and also uh, ability to enter uh, foreign markets that may require connections and so on. Now, some of our technology incubation managers actually have got these connections like Frank, but I think we probably need more. And uh, I believe that one of the underutilized potential is that Singapore is actually a very cosmopolitan country. Even NUS itself, we have a lot of students from ou outside Singapore. And if you are a Singaporean who want to start a company to enter China or India or ASEAN market, you should do well by you know, making good friends with uh, uh, your fellow students who are from Vietnam, China and all that. So that when you start your business, you tap on this uh, social network. Okay. I, I want to add that in the past, I have been here for four and a half years. In the past, I see a lot of changes within this city already. I see that people are more outgoing. They're more willing to experiment. And I see that they are more willing to, uh, um, to, to try the, 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 the non, the extraordinary, the, the, the fun things. And I also, I see many of them, uh, maybe you know, NUS, NUS Enterprise or NUS Business School have been, try, have been doing something right, that I start to see people that maybe at the beginning, right after graduation, they don't want to work for a startup. But a few years later, some of them are beginning to say, I want to be my own boss and do my own company. Yes. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dean. And also, Prof Wang, what you pointed out in terms of um, the resources that we have available in the room, I think I would like to take a second and to put these guys on the spot and have them raise their hand. For example, I see Springs uh, Patrick Lim, who's charged with uh, developing entrepreneurs in Singapore. Want to see your hand? And uh, Prof Hocom, anybody else? We could. <laughs> so there's your resource. Yeah. OK. <laughs> That's right. So those are the people that you want to see uh, to get your seed money during a networking session. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Patrick, for being a great sport. <coughs> thank you. All right, I do see a question back there. Yes. Yes, uh, actually more of a comment. Uh, my name is Jason Yotopoulos, and I head uh, global research and business incubation for SAP. And it turns out that uh, with the partnership with uh, EDB and NRF on Monday in the CREATE Center, we actually open the SAP Global Research and uh, SAP Next Business and Technology Center, uh, focused indeed on incubating the new set of businesses for Asia. And I very much appreciate the panel discussion today. As we're all students of incubation, I myself am an ex-venture capitalist of a decade in Silicon Valley. And we've been doing corporate incubation for the past four years, and now propagating this incubation across the world uh, with a focus uh, here in Asia. And just, just two brief comments. Um, I believe that technology is a great enabler when it comes to helping breed entrepreneurial opportunities. We're here in Singapore to take advantage of opportunities like digital biology synthesizing the genome uh, in a very rapid way. Um, uh, smart sensor enabled urban environments and many, many other opportunities. 
But at the same time, when it comes to incub incubator uh, and incubation, we find that in economies like India and South Africa, where we've had a number of more socially minded uh, business opportunities, one of the things that the panel alluded to, which I wanted to underscore, is that indeed it's, a, it's almost a false dichotomy to look at profit versus social good. The, the perspective that we take, which has actually worked, um, whether it's working with the six million Kirana store owners uh, in India, or whether it's working in South Africa you know, for, uh, for uh, nut exchange, uh, and how you uh, enable people with information to, to better trade uh, nuts in their local businesses, we view it as an ecosystem. And um, uh, many of our global multinational customers are actually interested in connecting into uh, this bottom of the pyramid, uh, if you will. And that's one way through technology-enabled means that we've been, you know, we've been able to be successful both in terms of social impact as well as financial good. I'd be interested in the panel's perspective, therefore, on how this ecosystem view perhaps can help enable uh, you know, reaching these bottom of the pyramid opportunities or even, you know, even growth economy uh, opportunities that happen to be more mainstream because uh, that's very much a perspective that we're taking which has had some success. And then the second question would be how corporations like ourselves can help enable this ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem of a region like Singapore. Two questions. So Jason, thank you very much. You said your first question was how to reach. Say again, your first question was for? Yeah, the first question is around um, how one leverages ecosystems in marketplaces to further this social innovation. And then the second question is uh, for both uh, parts of the panel, how can large corporations like ourselves uh, now you know, bringing more than 100 uh, entrepreneurs into this region over the next three years, how can we be helpful to you in your efforts? Do you guys want to take the second one first? You want to take the second one first in large terms of? Mm. Large corporations. Large corporations. <laughs> <laughs> Who is in the billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars here? <laughs> we need someone like that to answer the question. Yeah. Well, uh, I think in general, through our discussions, all the, uh, the, the ecosystem for, for incubating high tech or social impact uh, startups are, are pretty much missing in 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 here and there, and and I think this would be definitely a great uh, contribution to to help. Uh, we have been discussing about how to overcome, uh, you know, financing the missing of financing system, missing of uh, training, missing of legal systems and also the overall legal and, and, and regulation part of it. So I think anything that can improve the ecosystem certainly would, would help. That's a very general comment. Mm -hmm. Maybe a comment from uh, maybe slightly different perspective, but actually related uh, this uh, uh, asking about Singapore incubator and then Frank comment that you says, uh, Tim Yang says you think Singapore is a city uh, Frank says you should think about a market elsewhere. So uh, obviously China is a huge market uh, in, in, in several perspectives. One is the uh, order the, the small, medium-sized companies are very hungry for any sort of innovation technology to elevate themselves. Uh, China itself is a market to consume, can consume a lot of technology. And uh, so it's a very large consumer as well. So. We are here to promote in, I call it, globalized open incubation. By that I mean that our incubators are open to everybody, but we're not seem to say life is too good, so no one wants to leave Singapore. Mm. If you don't mind, you can come to my incubator, I'll readily give you a couple of cubicles right away without charging. <laughs> uh, but uh, we always say also have a huge amount of talent pool. What we don't have is experienced entrepreneurs and people that can uh, facilitate the entrepreneurial processes. That, that's why we are building uh, incubators. Uh, the globalization, actually, in my thinking, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's two ways. One is we can spin in technology from all over the, the world, um, since China is producing world, a product for the world. So you can think about just not going to China, because eventually the whole world benefit from the process. Uh, second is we probably can change the mindset. Uh, when we, a corporation grows very big, 
you think about going to market outside Singapore, outside United States. But why can't we create a startup company since day one as a globalized company? Meaning we incubate your biotechnology here in Singapore, but your market application incubation may actually in China, we can happen concurrently. So we are looking for that kind of opportunities uh, to, to change the traditional incubation. I would, I would first say that we are actually trying to work together. So if you want the incubation thing activities, maybe the one that we are trying to create together later. <laughs> let, me, let me comment in this way. The first thing I feel is that innovations very often is for meeting needs. When, they, when market friction is, limit, is, 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 is low, you can meet the needs providing social service and also make a profit. Very often, the bottom of the pyramid problem is not really about this, it's, uh, it's about that there exist market fractions. I think from my perspective as an educator, we really need to try to give the students a wide array of screen, allow them to connect the dots based on caring attitude. If they do, they can see the connection between technology and needs and they can serve. I remember vividly in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the early 90s when I was, uh, was it in early, uh, no, yeah, it was roughly about 2000. I was in New York. I came across two MBA students in Stern NYU and I remember they were talking about mobile phone, using the phone to transfer money and I asked them why they want that. They said basically doing this they can help to transmit money to the poor rural people in some countries in this part of the world, and they're from this part of the world, and they think it would be a great social service, and they believe that they can make money too. Now, you know, the rest, we know what happened, et cetera, et cetera, but for them, here is the other thing. They have the wide radar screen, they care, they see the connection, they see the profit opportunity, but they see also a lot of distortions at the beginning. There were all kinds of entry barriers that make it very difficult to, to enter, to, to happen. Thank you. Mm, thank you, <coughs> thank you. You know, believe it or not, it's 3.30. We were kind of out of time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm sitting here writing down these notes. And I honestly think that it will be, you know, I will be doing a conclusion injustice of trying to do one or wrapping up what we said, you know. So I'll just share with you my biggest personal takeaway. You know, I took away that innovation drives growth. And growth is happening in Asia, if anything, faster than ever. Okay, and also not just in terms of innovation, the innovative ways in using innovations, the mobile phones, you know, for example, and also um, Abishkar's way of using technology, the larger bandwidth, you know, by innovative ways of using technology innovations, we are touching and we are helping and we are also benefiting, if you will, so that we may be sustaining the, um, you know, the reach to the um, uh, lower and the base of the pyramid. Um, this morning, I personally was uh, quite moved by a, an example that uh, Mr. Rai shared with us. Um, see if this refreshes your memory, and I would love for you to share with the audience because I think it encapsulates the complementing factors of innovation and also social impact. You shared with us um, a, a business pitch you were giving uh, and where this gentleman said he'd expects 8%. Remember? Can you share with our audience the 8% and why he thinks 8%? And then the, um, the bottom line is I want you, if you don't mind, share with you in terms of you know, what you have seen happening in terms of those markets that you said were untapped, no competition, and the vast numbers that are out there. I think that's, that's a wake up story. Can you do that for me, please? I'll try. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the context has changed, so I'll give. So we were actually sitting and there was actually a plan to launch, uh, launch a billion dollar fund and this was actually some very elite venture capital background people. And they basically said, we are going to launch a billion dollar fund and we are going to change the way India looks and because we are going to make impact, we'll only make 8% return. So, sounded very amusing to me. So I actually said, so how would you actually make a 8% return on a billion dollar fund. And, uh, and I started asking them very basic questions. So let's assume you made an investment, you deployed $200 million, and one of your first investments became very successful. 
the first 20 million and it gave you a billion dollar back, what will you do? Will you only take 8% back? Uh, how would you know you have made 8% return? Because it takes 10 years for the time that, till the time I have returned every penny back to the LP. I won't know whether I've returned the fund or I've returned 8% or 3% or 11%. Not only that, before you have actually made the investment, how do you know you will make the impact? Finally, you are not going to make the impact. The money is being given to an entrepreneur who has to make the impact. And there is no guarantee he'll take your money and make the impact. So how did you make all these assumptions before starting up? And then suddenly everybody realized that nobody knew whether you're going to make eight or 18 or zero person return. But that's basically how top-down thinking starts. Uh, it's also actually a thinking frameworks of thinking. So the reason why we wanted a billion dollar because the number looks nice. So if big people are involved, billion dollar is the right number. Nobody knew whether the country can absorb billion dollar actually. If you actually look at the JP Morgan report which came with Rockefeller Foundation on BOP, it talks about $25 billion of BOP market. I can vouch for it for last 11 years. And by the way, we are one of the first ever impact funds. I've been trying to raise capital. Reaching 120 million has taken me 11 years and I'm still struggling to find money all over. I don't know where that $25 billion is hiding. The point is writing that report is easier and finding that money is much more difficult. More so finding that money and deploying it properly is almost impossible. So if somebody gives you a billion dollar, chances are you're going to ruin the market. Uh, not really constructed because it's much more difficult to build it. I'm sorry I digress from the question you asked, but <coughs> these are some of the challenges that actually uh, you will face. It's actually patient, long-term, and very perspiring kind of activity. It's not glamorous, it's not sexy, though in the business schools it sounds extremely the thing to do. It is not really the best thing to do. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. Thank you, Mr. Rai. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of NUS Business School and Stanford University, we thank our very distinguished panel um, to share with us your insight and your experience. And we also thank our audience for sharing your afternoon with us. We do have a reception uh, planned for you, and we strongly encourage you to continue the dialogue with the panelists and also with our angel investors whom uh, have so kindly raised their hands. Okay. And also to our um, overseas viewers, uh, thanks for joining us, and we wish everyone a very happy holiday season, and we wish you to continue to do well and to do good. Thank you.